This is Michelle. Michelle uh, Assad. Yes, sir. Hey, it's Mike and Jay from the Detroit cast. How are you? Hey, Michelle. I'm doing great. How are you? We're doing good. We just got done with your book, Breaking Cover, My Secret Life in the CIA oh. and What It Taught Me About <laughs> What's Worth Fighting For. Great book. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate you reading it. Of course. Is, is it doing well? It is, yes. Uh, very exciting to get the response that I've had. Yeah, it seems like a good time to release a book like this. I mean, it's kind of everywhere in the world right now, you know, with, with wars going on and the need for interrogation of terrorists. It's a good time to release a book like this. Immigration issues and so sure. forth. Right. Oh, yeah. It's so timely. That's the thing you can't plan. Well, I, I think, you know, just as people, we have this, like like Jay wants uh, one of his kids, he, he wants to start training him now with video <laughs> games, and he wants him to be some, like, Jason born in training, you know, as a, as a, as a youngster. <laughs> and I think we all have that feeling like, oh man, to be in that world, you've got to just be a special human being and, and James you, Bond. Yeah. Right. Train your whole life to learn everything. And, and, you know, right. but, but then reading your book, it's like, eh, I just threw my name in the hat and just figured ah, what the hell, why not? And, and, <laughs> Serendipity. <laughs> and they kind of picked you. It wasn't something you dreamed about your whole life. You just, you know, throwing in, you know, you saw a speaker or something and, and just threw your resume in there. And, and so what is it that they, you think they saw in you that went, okay, we got to call this girl back. Um, it was a focus on the Arab world and the fact that I had been at Georgetown, I had a master's degree in Arab studies. And I think because I had traveled a great deal in the Arab world already, so I'd been on the streets of Cairo, I showed that I had a passion for that part of the world. I think that's what grabbed their attention. But both you and your husband, and that's what's interesting about this book too, and your story is the fact that your husband was also a CIA operative in the Middle East. Both of you guys got into the game before 9-11, is that right? Exactly. What, Which what is was so it? fascinating. Yeah. What was it that Sorry. compelled you around that time to pursue it? So my interest started um, during right after a mission trip when I graduated high school. And so my husband and I, who weren't married at that time, um, traveled to Egypt and volunteered. Uh, it's his home country, and he put that group together. And we volunteered in an orphanage for a month. And it was my first exposure to the Middle East. And I found it so fascinating because it wasn't anything like uh, anything I knew. This culture was so different. And so I kind of became my passion to like understand the Arab world. So I kept just getting abroad. I kept studying abroad, doing mission trips, just trying to travel as much as possible. And of course, that eventually took me to Georgetown and uh, trying to get my master's degree in Arab studies. And of course, as you know, that's where uh, the CIA recruits out of Georgetown and that's where I threw my resume into the bin. And they select you as a potential candidate, and you're, you're ultimately put into the training process and so forth. What, what was the interview and vetting processes uh, that you had to go through and then, and then the training process? Describe that for us. It is brutal. It's so <laughs> brutal. <laughs> There's nothing easy about being vetted by the U.S. government. Because, yeah. um, of course, you have to make sure not only are you not getting somebody who could be a double agent, um, but you want to make sure you're getting people with the right personality to do this job because it's, it's not a job. It's a whole lifestyle. It's your entire life. And so they got to make sure that you're the kind of person who can um, work well under large amounts of, of stress and pressure. And so that all starts with the vetting process. Ugh. So you have really long interviews where you're spending hours with the recruiter and then you have psych interviews and psych uh, tests examinations and the polygraph, which is horrible, um, but a, a integral <laughs> yeah. part of that process. Yeah. I, I've heard that, that the polygraph, like you don't understand until you're sitting down and they wire you up and they put a clip on your finger. And it's like, just, and it's just like, act natural. Just act natural. And people, people, <laughs> yeah. people that have gone through that, they're like, dude, you have no idea how brutal and scary it is. It is. It is. Yes, and it and for a lot of us who, oh my goodness, that we're they have so like religious backgrounds, and you're taught, you know, if you've even considered a sin in your heart, it's like you sinned, and so you know, you just think <laughs> you have this movie reel of material of your whole life, everything you've ever done or considered doing wrong, you know, and it's making the polygraph like blow up. Uh. <laughs> It, it almost reminds me of the e-meter or whatever they, that Scientologists put people through. Like they want to know everything yes. you've ever done. And so that right. they just, so they have it is, is it going through your mind? Like, Oh God, do I have to tell them about that one really embarrassing thing that happened when I was yes. this? 
Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, of that's, course. that's Absolutely. sounds terrible. <laughs> hey, Michelle, yeah. you talked throughout your book about specific challenges that you encountered because of your gender, and that started even during the CIA training processes and was glaringly obvious once you were operating in the Middle East and debriefing insurgents. Can you give us a, f- a few examples of maybe some of the hurdles that you sure. had to overcome or even dangers that you were subjected to just because you were female? Sure. So um, the first Mm -hmm. shock that I had was in training when my male colleague and I had our, um, the individual whose job it was to really mentor us in the beginning of the training process. And he was a a legend at the CIA. He had an amazing career, but he was an older man. He was probably in his, in his eighties at that point. And he couldn't even look at me during training. He would just look at my male colleague in the room, like the entire time. (laughs) So it was really awkward. And it, what yeah. what do you what do you think that is? Do you think that's the that these old hardened veteran guys are like ah damn PC culture? Now I'm stuck with a woman. Yeah. is that what it is? Exactly. Yeah, it's she's not totally tough. That. Yes, mm-hmm. she, I mean she's smiley. Look at her. She couldn't do espionage. Like she's nice. She's friendly. This is not the material we should be looking <laughs> right, for. Right. Right. Do, do you think in the end, when, when all was said and done, when you look back at your whole career, do you think being a woman was beneficial to you or do you think it really hindered your career? It was beneficial only because I found a way to make it work for me. And I, I had to create a strategy for myself that allowed me to approach operations with my unique personality and skill set. And so it was like, you know, the whole world is working against you. You know, the culture is working against you in the CIA, with her, you know, with the, the terrorists in the debriefing room. But the fact that I could figure out, you know, using my emotional intelligence, how to turn my disadvantage into an advantage, I can now say that that was my greatest um, asset, but it took a lot of work to figure out how to, how to, how to stand out at the CIA mm-hmm. being well, so different. We'll talk about some of the dangers that that posed. So just being a woman operating in the middle yes. East. So one of my uh, scariest moments was when I was driving to work oh. during my first tour. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's brutal. You clearly read that part. I did. We all did. Yeah. <laughs> and so I was driving, I was not with my husband. He was traveling and I was in an ambush situation and I realized that um, you know, there was a car behind me, there was a man in front of me, and I was so vulnerable as a female driving my own car. And at that time, um, Westerners were targets of opportunity. So if somebody ran into you and saw you, they'd kidnap you and sell you to Al-Qaeda. And so my husband ha- and I had always told each other, like, you cannot get taken. And so that day, I realized that it was either me or the guy in front of my car who was blocking me. And I ended up having to hit him with my vehicle twice in order to get him to move so I could remove myself from a situation that could have gone south very quickly. Well, to set the scene for people listening, this is a woman driving to work, stopped at a red light, and a couple guys are just crossing the street. And they look and they notice it's a female. And then they yeah. stop and turn into animals. Which is, but go ahead, Jay. <laughs> yeah, no, this passage really hit me where you say, as the man's eyes honed in on me, they flashed the look that I know well after living in some of the most conservative cultures in the world. It was the look of a hungry dog that had just seen his first meal in days. It was a look of perversion, depravity, and darkness that was so revolting it made my skin crawl. You would have thought I was completely unclothed in the driver's seat. Yeah. Oh, it's. And, <laughs> and then the zombies, the zombies start coming, yeah. right? Yeah. Just walking toward yeah. your car, and you sense, like, I have got to get off the X, as you say in the book. Like, I've got to get out of this yeah. spot where I'm susceptible to ambush. Yeah, because, you know, the men were just coming from every direction. I could see them through all of my mirrors, and I, and I knew that once that car was surrounded by, you know, hundreds of men, that's it. Like, I'm done. That- and I knew in that moment, like, I had to just act quickly in order to not be a victim and, and that would have never happened had I been, you know, completely covered with only my eyes showing. Right, um, right. In that part of the world, the women were, I mean, you couldn't even see most of their eyes. They were that much covered. Oh. So for him, the fact that I had a bare face was just too much for him <laughs> oh, to yeah. handle. I mean, he's making like, like, mo- like a monkey would do in the wild, just like whatever. He's yeah. making those hand signals. Yeah. I don't want to offend you. But, um, but yeah, then, then you're, yeah. you're talking about how, at one point, I think around that same spot, like when there's a car accident, 
like men will flock to the car just, just to get just a glimpse men, of women and have their noses smashed against the windshield and the windows just to see if there's a woman inside ah, yeah. just to see some skin like, oh yeah it's so foreign and so weird yeah you say michelle you, you you mentioned a moment ago how you were attracted to this culture and the difference in the culture i mean is that healthy i mean <laughs> when when you see something like that what what are your thoughts <laughs> So for me, being a student of human behavior, I was like, why do they do that? I was trying to understand, like, why do people act in a certain way? This behavior is so foreign to me. So it's not as if I loved every part of that culture so much as I was just driven to try to understand it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you're more analytical than me. I just go, losers, get out of here. <laughs> Spr- get the spray here. bottle out. Yeah, I know, it is. You almost want to spritz them. Get out of here, you. <laughs> you know, Jay, Jay and I both have wanted this for a while, and it's kind of a tough question to ask, but do you think Islam fits with Western culture? I think that Islam, that is, as it's practiced in Muslim-majority countries where the um, – where Islam is the basis for everything in life, meaning your whole constitution is the Sharia law. Right. And the fact that Sharia law is very different than Western law. It says, if you're a Muslim, these are your rights. And if you're anything else, you're down here. So from the get-go, you have a very uh, a system that works against anyone who's not in that particular religion. So when you understand that, you realize, no, Islam or Sharia law inherently is not democratic. Yeah. You know, when you're categorized by your religion, that's a problem. Yeah. Or, and then when you don't allow people the freedom to choose their religion, so if you tell Muslims, you must always be Muslim. You cannot be agnostic, atheist, or anything else by threat of death. That's obviously also a problem. Well, it's it's interesting, and I, I'm going to horribly paraphrase this, but I was I was reading recently this this scholar in like 1880s, and he's given a lecture in Oxford, and he was talking about this religion fitting in around the world, and and he said that you know it it will never work because of when Muhammad died, he left no room for growth for as societies grow, you adapt to them and you grow with them, and it kind of just ended there, and so to be a true um, you know, living in, in Islam and Sharia, that, like there, there's no room for that to grow. It is what it is. It stays there. So you can't really call yourself a part of that religion if you try to alter it. Does that make sense? Right. Yes. I think that's pretty accurate. And so a lot of people will say, yeah, but my Muslim next door, they're the nicest person. And they, and I'm, they are. They're fabulous. Yeah. But for those who don't want to practice Islam, they can never you know, they're really not allowed to announce uh, formally or officially, like, I no longer believe this. It's just not permitted in yeah. Islam at its core. Yeah, a troubling lack of flexibility. Yeah, yeah. And, and <laughs> when you see it spreading throughout, you know, Europe, and, and there's some horrible stories there, and I, I never know how much to believe, how much the media is right. spinning a story <clears throat> to, to sensationalize it. But boy, it doesn't. Some right. of the images and some the, of the, the scenes, no-go areas in yeah, Belgium and Germany it sounds and so forth. Awful! It sounds awful. Right. You know, when I see that, when I see places, or when I'm traveling in Europe, and I'm in areas where suddenly I'm scared because I see guys who are acting as like Sharia advocates, telling women what they can and cannot wear in the street, or trying to prevent you to go going certain areas. That just makes my skin crawl because mm-hmm. I, I've experienced that in the Middle East and they're trying to bring that into Europe and that's, that's, okay, that's a problem. Now, you, I, I want to rewind a little bit and talk about your CIA career still. You were in Iraq between 2006 and 2007, the bloodiest part of the war there. It was ironically yeah. there that you, you feared most going there, but it's where you realized yeah. that you could absolutely do the job as an operator and do it well. What were the breakthrough moments for you personally during that time in Iraq? Yes, yeah, so and my major breakthrough moment was when I was about to go into uh, a debriefing with a really bad guy, and I needed to get a particular set of intelligence details out of him. And before I walked in that room, having studied the Arab world so much, I knew what my challenges were. I knew I was going to walk in the door. I knew he wouldn't respect me. I knew he wouldn't see me as somebody capable of being an intelligence officer. And so I thought, okay, yeah, I have this job to do but I have this mountain I have to get over. And then I just told myself, I was like, oh my God, Michelle, you've been preparing for this your whole life. Like, this is your moment. You can do this. 
Mm-hmm. And when I walked in that door and I applied my knowledge of Arab culture to that interaction with that insurgent, and I was able to turn him around completely to the point where not only did he um, respect me, but now he really liked me and wanted to work hard to please me and yeah. provide the intelligence. I was like, holy cow, I did it. So not only am I, you know, all those years I wondered if I was good enough to be in the CIA, I now realize that I was actually a really good intelligence officer, and it just transformed my career at that point. Now, are you wearing a headscarf? Is this when you were interrogating Abu Muhammad, I think? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. So no, I wasn't wearing a headscarf, but I was very careful to dress conservatively and look professional and all of that. Because that could go the other way, where he so loses respect for you for, for daring to not wear a headscarf. Yeah, at the same time, let's, you know, it's kind of like, let's not play this game. You know I'm a Christian, so not, let's not pretend like I need to have my head covered. Mm-hmm. Um, they all assume that we're all Christians, right or wrong. They just assume that. And so when you walk in there confident in who you are and what you stand for, they actually kind of respect that. Mm. You know, they begrudgingly respect that, you know, you have, you know who you are and where you're coming from. And I thought the most important thing to communicate with him in the first few minutes of that meeting was that I was intelligent. And so I had to just speak about Iraq and terrorism and just show him that I was insightful and I was smart. And that, and you could just see in his eyes, in his nonverbals, it's like, oh my gosh, this does not compute. <laughs> this is yeah. not what I was expecting. And so what do you, when you're in that moment, when you're face to face with a guy who you know is a virtual monster almost, you know, the, some of these right. really, really yes. hardened jihadist terrorist guys, what are you specifically looking for? What are the signs? Is it body language? Is it eyes? Is it fidgeting? All of that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Body language is huge. Body language will tell you what their words are not. So it'll give you an indication whether you're having a breakthrough or you're on the right track or he's not buying it. And I, I also think that the most important thing in those meetings is to understand who you're dealing with. So, like, I have to know what motivates that guy. What gets him out of bed every day? How intelligent is he? Because if I don't speak to that, he's never going to listen to me. So at the core of it, you've got to understand somebody's motivation. So you have to do a massive amount of intel before you ever get in that room. Yes, yeah. absolutely. You've got to go in there having a pretty good idea who he is. And then you've got to make sure, though, to keep, keep it open enough in your mind to readjust based on your interactions with that, that human being. So their motivation, when you're, you're talking to insurgents and you did a lot of that debriefing insurgents and interviewing insurgents in Iraq, what, what really did you find to be their motivation? It couldn't have just been the money payout that you guys might provide to get information because, I mean, you, if that's the case, then you'd have everybody walking off the street just telling you anything just to walk out with a bag of money. What, what was it that was more than money that was motivating them to cooperate with you guys? So um, to begin with, the whole money thing is huge. And so you have a lot of people walking in to provide information, which is fabricated so they could get paid. So you had to become really efficient at figuring out whether they're lying or they're giving you good stuff. But in terms of their other motivations, totally fascinating. So some of them just thought the CIA was interesting and cool and they had a big ego. And so they just wanted to like live this interesting life working with the CIA. (laughs) Some of them wanted to take out their competition. So they're engaging with you to tell you about terrorist X, (laughs) hiding from you that they're the other terrorist in the neighborhood and they want to take that other guy out which is fascinating. That's the part that's really hard for people to grasp is just how many sects there are in the region yes. that don't yes. get along. And, and so it's like, well, just, just wipe this out. It's like, yeah, but there's 12 other sects that you're not aware of. Right. And even within the same sect, you've got people for fighting for over control of the village or the neighborhood or fighting over limited resources. Yeah. So even within those groups, there's so much um, antagonistic and fighting and competition. So did you pay these guys off with like uh, American money? Did you give them the Iraqi dinar? Which I had quite a bit of dinar um, at one point, but uh, yeah, all right. I had a million dollars. <laughs> probably of di- not worth very much now. <laughs> I, I, I had a million dollars worth of dinar and I, I think I paid a grand for it. 
Nice move, Mike. Yeah, yeah I, uh, it was both. Yeah, I think we we dealt in all kinds of things. I think that's about all I can say there. <laughs> yeah, oh boy. <laughs> Paid in all types of currency. Hey, Michelle, a really interesting part of your book and, and your and Joseph's story is after you guys move on from the CIA, and it's what you do after in terms of security consultant work that then leads you to working with these refugees in Iraq. Um, but before you get to that story, and that's an interesting one, tell us how how hard it was for you to leave the CIA, just, you know, both personally and also kind of like practically, uh, what it's like to kind of unwind yourself from that world. Yeah, it's such a great question. I mean, you become, when you work the counterterrorism mission, you become an adrenaline junkie because what you're doing on a daily basis, you can see the results. You can see that you're saving lives. You're finding the car bomb before it goes off. Um, You're finding the safe house with all the guns, all the weapons. And so you just think, like, it's kind of scary, the idea of leaving the CIA and not doing something so interesting. And then the flip side of that is, what do you do when you leave the CIA? Because you have no resume. You can't tell anybody what you've done for yeah. 10 years. <laughs> yeah, you can't you list it. You have to roll a deck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, you've been undercover in the Middle East. It's not like, oh, I have this, you know, hundreds of people who can help generate a, a job or some interest. So what do you, you really do on a resume? You say I worked for the government? Yeah, you just have a giant 10-year you, blank you have a, spot on your resume. Do you have a cover story? You know, I worked for Kroger and I was a middle manager. You do. Sweet. You have a cover That's story. A I can just tell you that it is the most boring resume you've ever yeah. seen. Like you could never get hired <laughs> off of that cleared <laughs> resume. <laughs> Oh, that's so funny. Now, you, you ultimately, <laughs> you move on and, and you're, you know, you, you talk a lot in your book about um, the, the importance of prayer and your, your Christian faith, and you feel a tug to uh, move toward these humanitarian efforts, you and your husband, and you get hooked up in June 2015 with producer Mark Burnett, who people know from Survivor, Shark Tank, The Apprentice, and so forth, but they're, they're looking to support Christian families in the Middle East that have been displaced by ISIS fighters. So talk about how you got involved right. with that. Yeah, so a friend who happened to have been brought into this project connected us with Mark. And the idea was like, we don't know how we can help, but we've got to do something. And so, okay, so at that point in time, people were pretty, uh, people kind of understood what ISIS was and what the threat to Yazidis and Christians and other minorities was. That was clear. Um, and, and to regular moderate Muslims. But what, what wasn't clear is for these people who had been repeatedly uprooted by ISIS or Al-Qaeda, who had been, who'd been persecuted and couldn't imagine living in their ancient homes or ancient villages any longer, how do we help them find a place of refuge or a safe haven? And so we said, we're not an organization, but we ha- we're a unique like coupling of these skill sets that are so strange and different. Let's see what we can do. And so... Uh, to make a very long story short, it's totally you know outlined in the book. In four and a half months, we were able to find a country willing to take in a group of um, internally displaced people, and we succe- successfully airlifted 149 of those Iraqis out of northern Iraq to their no- new homes in Slovakia in, on December 10th, 2015. And, I mean, just being involved in a project of that nature was... Um, it was amazing. It was cool. It was difficult, but you could see how all of those skill sets you develop through your your lifetime all were able to be used in the service of a greater cause, and that's the best feeling in the world. And that's where listeners might remember you and Joseph from 2020 covering your efforts to do that, to get those Christian ref- yes. refugees to Slovakia. Um, there, there was no model to do what you guys were doing. I mean, you had to in large part, vet these people very, very closely to make sure they weren't ISIS sympathizers. And you uncovered yeah. some of them, right? I mean, as, as you were interviewing people, you, you definitely knocked some off the list because of concerns. Yeah. And, you know, it was just so interesting because we were so well positioned to do that, to vet these people, because the last thing you want to do is bring in uh, anyone who could pose a threat to the receiving country. So we had to say, look, we, we met with we did our due diligence, and we can say for sure these people are vulnerable. They're good people, and they're not going to come to your country and 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 be you know work for ISIS or just you know be a criminal element. Even that, we don't want to bring those guys in either. Mm-hmm. Well, not to get too political, but you know the Trump travel ban goes to this very issue, and it's this vetting process that you went through. You know how hard it was and how painstaking you guys had to go through uh, all the painstaking right. steps. 
is is that something that the public should be concerned about? Is our government currently able to vet these people properly? So the answer is no, we're not able to vet properly, and I'll tell you why. Very few people in the U.S. government even know what vetting is or how to do it. It is a very specialized skill set that requires substantive expertise. The problem, that it doesn't matter what administration you're talking about, they all use this word vetting. None of them have any idea what it is. Yeah, and, so, yeah. and I don't believe in adding extra layers to an all, already inefficient bureaucratic process that doesn't work. We have to make that process smoother, quicker, and we need to hire people and train people with the skill set to do that. And we, do, we are not there. We're not even anywhere close to you're that outnumbered. Right You're so far outnumbered. It's just not possible when you're talking about taking in hundreds of thousands of refugees or, or something. And, and I wonder if, if the, the problem is what we've all seen our entire lives is what Hollywood displays. Hollywood shows us what the FBI is like, what the CIA is like, and they're always <laughs> one step ahead of everybody. They're, they're always right at the right spot. They're, they've always got the perfect shot. They've got the save button. They've got, and, and it's just so not real. But I think we're all programmed to think that's why it's like, oh, yeah, you think of the CIA as some almost not human level. All knowing. Yeah, all knowing. And, yes. Well, and then it, you get in, you realize how very wrong that is. <laughs> yeah. How, how um, much do you rely on your. To give you, you know, no, go ahead. Go ahead, go Michelle. Ahead, sorry. sorry. I was going to say, you know, that the, the, the foundation of our vetting process in the U.S. government is running name traces. So to quickly educate your listeners on this, so fascinating. If you've got people tracing Arabic names that have been transliterated into English and they don't know the various transliterations and each government agency has their own standards that don't match, then essentially you don't have people running traces that know how to even do a trace properly. Oh, perfect. That's when, really the I, bottom of vetting. I feel you safe. Train, yeah, you have to train you? people. And how many how many yeah. how many times can you vet Muhammad Abdul uh, Abdul Muhammad in preparation Muhammad, for Muhammad this Abdul. book? I, I, I googled Abu <laughs> right. Muhammad. Yeah, Abu Muhammad. Good yeah, luck. like it's like good luck. There's eight billion of them. Um, <laughs> Michelle, how, how much do you rely on your gut feeling? Because this this is one of those those things where you you run the risk of being either too paranoid or being naive. And so how you know. How much are you relying on that? Like, I just don't feel right about this guy. Oh, my gosh. That was huge for me. Having an intuition that a case was bad or something was wrong or it just didn't feel right. And so it was really hard to then honor the intuition and do proper vetting or investigation because we were so busy in the war zone. And so it took a whole lot of extra energy to sit down and say, okay, what's bothering me? What's wrong with the case? And then what, what should I do about it? But intuition as an intelligence officer for me was absolutely critical. And once I realized that I kind of had a sixth sense and something wasn't right, then I kind of figured out what to hone in on. Um, and I wouldn't call it paranoia but as an intelligence officer, you're just supposed to not take anything at face value. Right. And for me, I don't believe things until I can prove it or I have some sort of, you know, ability to check it out on my own. Mm. And I, I think that's how you have to approach these things. And, and the, the, if you think about it, yeah. that intelligence you're getting is going to be actioned by military elements. And so you're putting your military elements, your colleagues at risk, their lives at risk if you're getting crap intelligence or fabricated information. Yeah, and that's the, not okay. The consequences are so dire if you're wrong. Right. They're just the, they're, the stakes are too high. You know, have you ever been outmatched by a guy, by a, by a you know, because you say in here how some of these guys are wickedly smart. You know, they're, they're not yes. dumb guys. They're, they're, they're very intelligent, some of these guys. Have you ever felt like, God, I, I, I lost. I, I was outmatched by that guy. <laughs> there were a couple situations where I really did have a, an intuition that something was wrong, but I was never in a position where I could really do anything about it. And I was like, man, I think that guy won. Yeah. So that, yeah. Yes, that happened. <laughs> yeah. Um, reading, reading some of the stuff really quick about going into Iraq. Like if I never have to fly into Baghdad international in a military plane, um, and, and hear things like <laughs> we're coming in black. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> cor- yeah, we're doing a corkscrew countermeasure to come into the airport. Um, I don't like a little turbulence. I don't. I don't think I could handle that very well. Can you describe what that's like to fly into yeah. Baghdad? Oh my goodness! I had never experienced anything like it in my life. But when uh, the stewards and stewardesses are like, "Okay, every light needs to be off in this plane. No electronics. All the window shades down." 
And then the, the plane is doing this corkscrew to stay right <laughs> over the airport so rockets can't be shot, you know, through the sky to take you out. Sure. I mean, you're just, like, white-knuckling it all the way to the ground. Uh, just like, oh, this is not what I envisioned. Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> and then to get to your green zone, it's, like, just just over the tips of the houses and the trees. Just to, don't give them any warning that we're up in the air and coming. It's just... The, the, the thought of uh, what that, I mean, it's just so different for, for life as we know it. But anyway, Michelle, thank you so much for the time. It's a great book. It I is. Hope- very, very inspiring story, how yeah. ordinary people can do extraordinary things. And we thank you for your time, Michelle. It's yeah. awesome. Breaking cover. Thanks, thank Michelle. Thank you, Bo. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Right. Good Take luck. Care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye.